Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Well, more and more of us are cooking at home these days for pretty much obvious reasons. And that's great news, uh, since home cooking is the best way to control the food you eat and manage your health. But how can you make your home-cooked meals truly extraordinary? Well, to help me out, I'm joined today by my longtime friend and award-winning chef, Jimmy Schmidt. Jimmy is a three-time James Beard award-winning chef, that's actually remarkable in and of itself, who's opened restaurants across the United States, written several books about cooking, and has worked with me since 2004 to develop special collaborative dim dinners, exploring taste and nutritional development, and he's actually helped in manufacturing and designing some of the bars uh, at Gundry MD. So we go way back and I trust his judgment and uh, love his friendship. So on today's episode, Jimmy and I are gonna talk about all the nuts and bolts of cooking, how to find the right ingredients, how to create awesome flavors, which is, I gotta tell you, Jimmy's forte, and the common mistakes many home cooks make and how to fix them. Uh, years ago, Jimmy and I said that we want you to eat food that you love, but food that loves you back. And I think that has really been a core philosophy for both of us. So, Jimmy, it's so great to have you on the podcast. Good to see you, Dr. Gundry. It's always great to be with you. Thank you so much. All right, so I want to tell everybody how we met. You, you and I have uh, slightly different uh, versions, but one of the fascinating things about Chef uh, Jimmy is that he uh, was one of the early superstars in, uh, in chefdom, back when chefs were first getting recognized as stars in their own right. And uh, Jimmy was a young superstar chef in Detroit, and Donald Trump actually brought Jimmy to the desert, Palm, uh, Palm Springs, uh, a number of years ago to bring Jimmy's culinary talents to uh, the Rattlesnake Grill in Trump 29 Casino, of, of all things. And it was actually there that I met Jimmy. But before we get into that part, I want people to understand your background and the story of how you got into cooking coming out of Wayne State as this physicist is just, is, is just a protein biochemist is just too, too good to miss. So can you take us back memory lane and take us to France, et cetera? Sure, I'd love to. It actually started, I'm originally from Illinois, as you know, Champaign, Illinois, down in the farmlands. Uh, my father had a farm, although worked for the University of Illinois. And I was determined to be an electrical engineer and, you know, run around and chase, uh, you know, positively and negatively charged things. Um, and did, you know, did those studies for a number of years and then went to France to fulfill the language credits for my degree. And... Being a poor student, and I was pretty well, you know, down to pennies, uh, took food and wine classes so that I could eat and drink every day while I was in France, which seemed to be a perfect match. And as I started to get into the whole culinary arts in France and started drinking some wine, it all started to click. So I followed my chief instructor, Madeline Cammon, after my studies in France back to Boston and uh, she had a restaurant called Chez La Mer Madeleine in Boston, which was one of the two top restaurants in the United States, along with Alice Waters on the West Coast. And I quickly uh, got behind the stoves there and I really loved it and kind of, you know, just followed the course of action of uh, learning more and more about food, that type of thing. So that's how I got kind of diverted off of my uh, double E background. Uh, I had always intended to go on to be a physicist, as you said, to study at Wayne State University, which is, I moved from Boston to Detroit to pursue that. Once again, working as a chef for the London Chop House. Um, and that was a great old bastion, like the 21 Club in, in New York of, you know, um, 
industry icons as auto industry, you know, eating and drinking their way through business on a daily basis. I found a, a great platform to, uh, you know, explore my culinary arts. And during that time is when I got recognized. So I thought, you know, uh, this could be a good thing. So I got diverted into the food end of the world. And then Dr Donald Trump called. Yeah, uh, years later, yeah, Donald Trump actually <laughs> yeah. got diverted from Detroit and went out and did the first rattlesnake in Denver, Colorado in, Denver, in the yeah. 80s, and then came back and opened up m another version of the rattlesnake in Detroit. And uh, the Trump group had offices as they were bidding on the casinos for Detroit above me and ate in the restaurant every day and then convinced me to head to the West Coast where it was warmer, much better climate to uh, come out and have some fun. And that's how I ended up meeting you, which was the, you know, the most important thing that came out of ever that, that desert routine. And it's been <laughs> nothing but fun. We had a lot of fun out there in the desert. Yeah, so uh, you and I, I think, first met, uh, besides me eating uh, at the Rattlesnake Grill, but uh, we actually, they put on a, the American Heart Association put on a, a luncheon for women back when the Go Red for Women campaign started a number of years ago now. And uh, they asked you and me, you know, and we hadn't met each other, to kind of put on a little demonstration where I was, I was going to talk about healthy eating and you were going to cook healthy eating. And, you know, I'm going, oh yeah, right, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to tell a chef how to cook this crazy way. Well, it turns out that you and I had literally made a mind meld uh, weld and we just, it went, took off from there and we've become, you know, good friends ever since then. Absolutely. That's some fun time. The, um, we became very, you know, kindred soulmates per se, because that, had, that was the direction my cooking had gone. I did, um, you know, heart healthy cooking for all seasons with Alice Waters and Larry Forgione, as you know, that already yeah. started to explore, you know, cooking for big flavors, but also to deliver big nutrition so that when we got together on that stage and that book was also picked up by the Heart Association, which was great for sales. Uh, but when we got together on stage, it was a natural fit. And uh, since that day, we I think we've had a lot of good food and a lot of good fun. That's true. And one of the you you took over um, at, at a, a very famous restaurant in the desert that's now owned by the Waldorf Astoria Collection, uh, Hilton um, Morgan's in the desert at La, Qu La Quinta Resort. And we're there for a number of years. And um, folks, uh, Jimmy and I, he would put on these chef wine dinners. And one of our signatures of those dinners is uh, I would come out uh, with each course and Jimmy would tell, you know, why he did such and such a thing. And then I'd tell why this great tasting food was actually good for you. And, and people were shocked that decadent, flavorful, yummy food was actually good for their health. And it, it, in a way, we all want to assume that this decadent food is going to kill us. And, you know, we're, we're toying with disaster. But in fact, that's not true. No, uh, it's not true. And it, yeah, those dinners were a lot of fun because usually a wine and food dinner, you're just trying to get the wine to kind of match the flavors in the food, which are, you know, is a, the best of all marriages from a taste point of view. But if you back up the nutritional Parts, as well as many of the nutritional, you know, activators like turmeric and ginger and cardamom and, and all of these wonderful spices that actually add depth to the meal, they also add depth of nutrition, as you, in, you know, taught me. And we, you know, continue to explore matching these wonderful nutrients with the wine, you know, so the dinner almost became a, you know, a marriage of the nutrients in the wine, which was, I think we're probably some of the first people that ever did that. Yeah, and you're actually, I think you're the, one of the few chefs to this day that I know or have watched 
that uh, if you're going to do a, a wine dinner, uh, number one, you, <laughs> you demand that the, the wines from the winery be sent down to you uh, long beforehand, and then you actually work with each individual wine and decide, you know, what spices, what, you know, what dish is going to pair best with this, this particular wine. And, you know, that really impressed me, number one. But uh, the idea that you would, you know, bring out flavors within a food to match a wine is pretty impressive. Well, the, the, the concept is when you taste the wine, the wine will really tell you what goes with it. So you have to kind of listen to the wine and see what's going on within it because it's a living, changing, you know, environment on its own. So pairing up flavors that actually are complementary or in some cases, you know, aren't so complementary, but strip out the bad flavors in the wine. So my job is to to match the flavors, but also to kind of clean up any of the, you know, extra things floating around in the wine while it's developing. You know, the tannins can be balanced with fats and acids and different herbaceous flavors. If you add herbs into a sauce or such, your mind will think the flavors are those herbaceous flavors from the wine will actually go into the food, which kind of cleans up the wine in some cases. So it's, it's a lot of fun getting all those things to work. And then likewise, those other nutritional spices and such only add to the depth and the nutrition you know, and I've learned so much from you in this parameter and direction of, of being a guide down this taste path. I, you know, thank you so much for, you know, sharing with me your knowledge. Uh, my pleasure. We, I think it's been a mutual admiration society. Speaking of which, we were talking off camera. Uh, you and I paired up uh, uh, three weeks ago to uh, go to a resort uh, outside of Missoula, Montana called Paws Up. And we put on a wellness weekend uh, there at Paws Up and invited a couple of biodynamic winemakers to join us. And we were joined by your good friend and another phenomenal James Beard award-winning chef, Nancy Silverton. Many people may know her from Osteria Maza um, from LA and she's now expanding kind of worldwide. But uh, let's talk about that because that, I think this is really illustrative. You, you've been brainwashed enough by me through the years to uh, do lectin-free cooking, but we, we brought and invited maybe the antithesis <laughs> of lectin-free cooking uh, in Nancy Silverton, who was a great sport. Uh, so, and you invited her, you got her to come. So just take our listeners kind of, okay, how do you take, you know, a, a lectin queen and say, guess what, this weekend, you're gonna, you're gonna cook as best we can lectin free. So well, first, how'd that go? Well, first of all, um, Nancy Silverton is, you know, famous for all of her pastry work and her restaurant work and such. But, you know, she was the founder of La Brea Bakery. So, you know, right. kind of sitting on top the pinnacle of lectin success. So <laughs> she's made millions out of sell selling lectins. And then, you know, after after the bread comes the pastas. So... You know, yes, it was a uh, stretch of imagination that Nancy would accept, but she's such a wonderful sport. And she was very intrigued by this whole concept. So um, I shared with her a slideshow that I did back for the Stanford uh, Brain Mind Summit that we both attended and you had presented at and said, you know, here's what lectins are, here's what phytates are, and, you know, how to kind of maneuver around them, you know, and in doing so, you know, it's really good for your microbiome instead of fighting against it. And it's a much better alignment. And she took it well to heart and has been thirsting for more and more information on it. So many of her recipes adapt very well into this concept by changing some of those uh, more lectin enhanced ingredients, you know, naturally. So, 
she was a great sport. Obviously, you tasted the food. We both enjoyed everything that she made. And her thorough flavor style of food that every single component adds flavor, you add, add the nutrition onto it, too. And now I think she's uh, going to be a good challenger, you know, on uh, a line food that's, you know, better for you. Yeah, uh, my wife Penny and I had the opportunity to go to uh, one of her uh, dinner's solo performances at the Ojai Valley Inn um, last weekend, and it was interesting. I I got to you know meet with her before the dinner and kind of go over what she was serving, and she said, "Now look, you're going to find that most of the stuff I'm serving tonight is you know is really compatible." And, you know, thank you for that. But there's a couple of things that, you know, I'm still going to try to kill you. Uh, you know, she was, she was a really good sport. But I think you probably planted a nice seed in her that there are, you know, other ways to do this. Let me, let me think about one of the things that I think you've done amazingly well is figure out how to hide or imitate uh, a great food with a, with a replacement. For instance, uh, years ago, you used to make um, risotto uh, not using rice. Uh, you want to tell us about that? How did you get that crazy idea? Well, um, you know, first of all, um, I kind of think of flavors as colors. So, you know, and I'm working on a book called The Color of Flavor. So there's a certain wavelength and you know to light and colors and likewise in food there is similar you know taste spectrums per se you know an old trick is to ask a sommelier to describe a wine without using any food you know like cherry it tastes like raspberries you know it all that leaves them is leather and tobacco so it doesn't give a <laughs> lot of room to work with you know maybe some terroir or some Dirt. <laughs> yeah. So food is very, you know, oriented by color. So, you know, in looking at that spectrum and trying to, you know, move rice out of the risotto and rice is very white in flavor. So if you want to have a different, you know, an asparagus risotto, you want more green flavors, rice is not going to do it. So this brings you to another alternative. So that's kind of a long intro. But what I did was I took celery root and cut it to the size of a grain of rice. And that would be replace the rice in the risotto. Now for the creaminess and that type of aspect of it, the trimmings that from not cutting so great, I cooked those and turned it into a puree of, of the uh, celery root to make the creamy part of the risotto. So you really actually only cook the kernels or the grains of, of the celery root to mock the rice for two minutes, you add it into the puree, and then you have a lovely risotto that can fool you using celery root. Now, originally, it was designed to go with white truffles. Now, white truffles don't, as you know, taste white. They taste this earthy, brownish, tan type of color. And funny enough, we used to do the white truffle, uh, you know, celebration every December and those white truffles on top of the celery root risotto was far superior to putting white truffles on top of white white rice risotto. So you got better nu nutrients out of the celery root, a great flavor and likewise better nutrition. So that's kind of the fun ways of, of bending these ingredients to fit in for better flavor and better nutrition. Then uh, tell, tell our listeners about how you fool somebody into thinking they're eating fettuccine pasta and it, it's not fettuccine pasta. Well, you can use a, a lot of different ingredients to achieve that, you know, uh, one of which is celery root or butternut squash will work in that type of direction. Um, you can even, you know, sheet out cauliflower in that type of direction. So you're basically taking vegetables for their, their structure and their resilience and turning them, you know, cutting in them into the shape of pasta. You know, uh, you can use leeks, you can use celery root, you can use even fresh uh, Belgian endive 
when it's just slightly heated, still has that crisp resilience to it. And you kind of combine those ingredients together, and it really comes off as a risotto because some of them are contributing a crispness. Some of them is, are contributing a, a creaminess that what pulls it all together. Yeah, I remember at, at one of your restaurants in the desert, the Classic Club, you used to fool people with this decadent fettuccine, and it was it was all made out of celery root that uh, that you had you know thinly peeled, and people would order it, you know, and, you, and I think you you called it fettuccine, uh, and people say, oh, this is the best fettuccine I've ever had, and you go, ha ha ha, yeah, um, you know, I'm saving your life, and you're thinking it's the most decadent, you know, awful thing in the world. Yeah, I actually got in a fight with a customer one night when I said, hey, by the way, it's good for you, and they got in a big fight. It's like, yeah, it's made with flour. It's like, no, it's not. It's like, stop lying to me. It's really That's good. That's right. You can't fool me. <laughs> it couldn't be. Yeah. So it's fun. Yeah, and I think you know that's the that's the fun thing that's actually driven me um, in all my books to to learn you know from you on you know you can you can make food that you love but that loves you back. Um, uh, you know, your, your brilliance in figuring out how to get the textures and the flavors that we associate with these foods and yet bring great nutri nutrition is just uh, kudos to you. Well, thank you very much. You're very kind. I'm glad you like it. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. It's really guided so much of what we do. Uh, and my recipe de developer, Kate, who's sitting here uh, listening to us, uh, I think it's guided her as well. All right, let's talk about cooking. That's why everybody tuned in. All right, what's, what's the hardest part of, of being, being a chef, of, of cooking? Well, um, it's, cooking is not hard. It's the timing that's hard. You have to be able to just, you put it on the fire and then you just got to take it off at the right time. So cooking isn't as hard as you think, but it comes down to timing. Now, flavor is very crucial. You know, the use of spices and seasoning to enhance it, especially when you want to, uh, you know, make cleaner food. And I think that, you know, kind of where a turning point for me was that kind of the, the color of flavor type thing. White sugar tastes white. White flour tastes white. Nobody runs into the pantry as a kid with a big spoon and takes a scoop of white flour. Maybe some sugar, but not Maybe white sugar. flour. So <laughs> as you start to eliminate lots of these starches and carbohydrates out of your food, it actually cleans up the flavor profile. So using, you know, ingredients, add an ingredient in that benefits taste and benefits flavor and benefits the nutrition, then you start it to line up really much more interesting dishes. What, what, do, what do most people not know about properly using ingredients and creating flavors? Where, where does everybody make a mistake? Well, I think that um, in, in using fresh herbs in, in that type of direction, uh, they make the biggest mistake of just adding them all in at the end. That's not what any of the big classical cuisines have done over time, whether it's Chinese or, or even some of the great Italians and this type of thing. You start off with a little bit of great olive oil or avocado oil to get it started. If you add garlic or onion in at that point, the volatile oils that are the flavorings of the garlic and the onions and the spices are mixed in with the oils, they're oil-based, not water-based. So you get all those flavors into the oil first. And then when you cook in that median, and the oil really transfers the heat from the pan or the air to the food. Because if you don't have something to transfer the heat, all you're doing is drying it out in that type of method. So if you get the flavor into the oil that you want to keep in the dish, and you get that to coat what you're cooking, you're about halfway home. The rest of it is is timing, and you know, and and a little bit of patience. To not try to turn it up and get it done in two seconds. But the crucial part is you cook the little garlic and such, and then you throw your red pepper flakes into it, 
then you would throw your basil into it to make a marinara sauce or that type of direction. Or you throw your different herbs into it to make a stir fry with ginger and garlic and chilies and cilantro because those go, the flavors go into the oil and then they stay in your dish. A famous Italian chef once said, if he walks into a kitchen and smells basil, he knows they don't know how to cook because the basil smell should be in the dish, not in the air. Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, uh, I, I, I just finished uh, up p putting my, my next book to bed. And uh, I'm, I'm a student of history, and I've always been fascinated by the spice trade of the Middle Ages. And I actually have a whole chapter that inadvertently talks about the spice trade. And it's interesting that people were willing to pay huge amount of money for what we consider culinary spices. Right. And you've named off a bunch of them just now. And people were willing to risk their lives um, going around the Cape of Good Hope to get to the um, Indies uh, and the Spice Islands, where, which now part of Indonesia. And uh, one of the things that I was reading just blew my mind is the spice trade basically came to an end when sugar plantations were established in the West Indies and the sugar rapidly became the drug of choice. Yeah. And yeah, using culinary spices just fell off a cliff and people switched over to, you know, their new favorite drug, which was sugar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I had, I guess I had not realized the power that sugar had in, in, in stopping the spice trade as we know it. Yeah, the sugar was a, a big change, and not just from a taste factor, you know, like making foods taste better, this type of thing, but it was a great, you know, caloric delivery situ situation, too. So perhaps, and I'm only saying perhaps, as a, you know, to another historian, that many of these spices, as you know, that they were, you know, black pepper and ginger and turmeric and these types of things, they enhance nutrient uptake in the body or, you know, assimilated it. And back at that time in Europe, you know, they didn't really have super nutrient based crops. I mean, parsnips did not have a lot of calories. Celery root did not have a lot of calories. And it wasn't until the, you know, uh, the potato being, you know, introduced into that society that you could then grow enough calories per acre to feed a whole lot of people. Hence the Irish potato famine. That, that's why a couple million people, a million died and a million left uh, yeah. because there wasn't enough calories. But sugar, man, that was mainline calories, but not necessarily good ones, as we know. No, you're right. And, you know, when we forget that you know, the new world was was the source of the potato. Yep. And you're right. So a lot of calorie dense foods, uh, we, we can thank, unfortunately, the new world. Corn, for yeah. instance, um, another wonderfully calorie dense food. Absolutely. Oh, well. Oh, well. All right. Um, everybody's out. It's uh, summer. The farmer markets are open. Uh, how do people find the right ingredients? Uh, do you have to go to the farmer's market? Uh, can you go to the store? Can you use dried ingredients? Help us out. Well, I think, you know, farmer's markets are great because you're getting closer to the source and it's fresher. Um, nature has been pretty good to us by, you know, if it, if it looks really attractive and it smells good and it tastes good, it's much higher in nutrients than one that doesn't, you know, kind of proven by the uh, eternal, uh, you know, hot house McDonald's uh, tomato. That tomato has about 40% less, you know, caloric value and nutrients than a fine ripened tomato. So uh, if we follow our nose and our taste buds, we're going to find more nutrition. Um, yes, you can buy it from grocery stores because they're, you know, bringing it in and trying to compete with the farmer's markets, which is great. And dried, dried items are great. I think that uh, you would agree that 
if they're peeled and seeded, they're probably we're probably better off for it, you know, to get yeah. to minimize the lectin intake, especially on you know the tomatoes and the peppers and the nightshades that people uh, you know flock to during the summer months. So, but that's yeah, get close to the source, you know, um, think before you eat, get rid of the seeds and get rid of the skins, you know, season them well. Um, lots of lots of fresh fruit is done in salads and such, which is good for the green lettuces and aricovera and all those kinds of things. Uh, a little less good with uh, the red guys of the tomatoes and the peppers, but that's you know that gets you a lot of fun flavors to play with. All right, are there any tools in the home kitchen that you think ev everybody ought to have or? What can you not live without? Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think one thing that's great in the home kitchen is a mandolin because you can slice things and julienne them very easily to adapt them for textures and flavors in that type of direction. Um, you know, now, a mandolin isn't an instrument we play, No, right? not the instrument you play. It's a long slicer thing that... Um, will take your fingertips off if you're not careful, but they're one, they're wonderfully fun. Um, it does allow you, it, you know, with those little wonderful baby potatoes that you un undoubtedly run across during the summer months, you know, you can slice them really thin and you can rinse them and such, and you can get rid of a lot of the starches that way. They cook more thoroughly, you know, that probably will reduce some of the other phytates and stuff running around in them during that process which is fun. So I think a mandolin is probably my number one, you know, go-to item to play with. And you, I, you use uh, food processors a lot. Yes? No? Um, no. Like if you, if, if you not whip up like a celery, celery root mashed potatoes that you taught yeah, me how to do? I do. I use it for, you know, making those purees. That's probably my number one thing I use. Probably the best appliance is, you know, like a Vitamix. I love a Vitamix. Now, a Vitamix is very empowering because, you know, like the uh, emulsion I use for the scallop up at Paws Up Resort, that was all, you know, vegetable based. That's roasted fennel and the roasted leeks, you know, and you throw all those ingredients in there and the ginger and the and Meyer lemons and you put that in it, and that will really put together a great emulsification. And emulsifications are ingredients that usually don't stay together. They combine into a sauce or an emulsion. So you can add wonderful plant-based nutrient ingredients and to accentuate the sauces and the flavors very easily. And then you can put in just a little bit of oil so you're not running up the fat. And that can completely replace all your vinaigrettes and all your kind of heavier caloric foods in that direction, uh, especially if you're having a salad or a piece of fish or something like that. It's a lot of fun. All right, let's talk about restaurant dining because I get questions about that all all the time and now we've got the world expert on it. All right, what's the one secret? Is there one secret you can tell people about dining in restaurants that, that they should know? Um, this, a dirty little secret, perhaps. Well, I think that the, the number one thing to avoid is, you know, fried foods and not so much because that you know, like uh, the crispy chicken with the batter on the outside for obvious reason. But, you know, the fryers do not usually have the best oil. And they usually have a lot of oils that are soybean based and such that have lectins in them, you know. So that's probably having a clean oil fryer, uh, you know, is, is wonderful. Like if you fry in, you know, some of like the carotene oil, which is, you know, the red palm fruit oil. The, the fried goods actually pick up that orange flavor, pick up the beta carotenes. That's a wonderful example of it, but not very many restaurants have that. And then on the other side of the equation, grilling is probably your cleanest method of getting something grilled rather than breaded or broiled or blackened or that kind of thing. So um, any, any tips for people who are 
following the plant paradox diet or lectin, limited lectin diet when they're dining out. Um, I, a good friend of mine, Tom Guy, always used to say the, the menu just tells you what the chef has got in the back. Is, is that true or do you hate to get orders that aren't what you want to do? Well, it could go either way. I mean, if somebody you know says, hey, I want this, that, or the other, I'm happy to oblige them. There are guests that's very easy to do. Back in the old Morgan's day, you know, people would come in all the time and say, I don't do, you know, I don't eat gluten. I don't do this. I don't do that. And so what can I have on the menu? And it was pretty much uh, everything, except for maybe the one pasta dish that was wheat-based that we had on the menu. So, you know, uh, chefs are pretty adaptive. I mean, you know, consumers have trained them from the gluten era you know, and from the allergen area, which has become more and more predominant, you know, the shellfish allergens and fish allergens. And like my son has a, you know, a sesame allergen, you know, people have become aware of these things. And, you know, although the United States only requires eight allergens be listed, you know that there's 16 in the world that'll kill you pretty quick. That should be listed. So, um, that's the big thing is be very specific about your allergens and, uh, and be honest. Don't come in and say, hey, I'm gluten free, but I'd like a double order of bread. That doesn't really, <laughs> you know, sustain us on the fact that you're being sincere with what we need to do for you. If, if a, can you trust a, a waiter who says, I can guarantee you that everything you're going to get is gluten-free, or is that more just talk? Um, it depends. I would say it's more talk. Because I think that they, you know, most people think gluten is just with wheat. And then obviously uh, gluten is a lectin, so many things that could trigger a reaction are laying out there in the food landscape, as you know only too well, that would also fall into that criteria. And obviously other grains, you know, do carry those proteins. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's, there's in, our, in our patient population, uh, about 70% of people who are sensitive to gluten and other proteins in wheat are sensitive to the proteins in corn. Right. And, they literally cross react and it is I have so many patients and I've written about this that are eating gluten free and you know are because they have celiac disease or other gluten intolerance and yet they're eating corn and corn chips and corn bread and corn t tortillas and they still have all these gut issues and when we test them and you know, corn is, is, oh my gosh, you know, that's what I live on. Well, you're not living very well, obviously. And when we take the corn away from them, uh, you know, they start to get better. So Yeah, the corn, the corn has its own challenges, as you said, with the proteins. And then also, you know, the, the phytates too. You know, right. the fresh corn with its phytates is an anti-nutrient, and it actually goes in and grabs them out of your body. You know, and hence, there's, you know, papers out there relative to the Aztecs walking off the plantation because of, you know, the craziness that comes from eating too much corn or not corn that was not the phytate. Not treated not, properly. Yeah, correct. they were not neutralized by the limestone grinding mills that they put it through. You know, and the side effects, you know, is dementia and dermatitis or hands would swell up, you know, and dysentery, yeah. the, the, the one famous three Ds of life, what everybody lives for. So I was down in Mexico giving a speech and the guy said uh, that was re researching him said that they thought that that may have been the reason why they walked off the plantation and left, disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing that's interesting as a, you know, as a student of the history of food is that so many times uh, we would take a native product that the natives knew how to, to detoxify. Uh, like corn, like using lye uh, or grinding it in, in lye, limestone to neutralize those factors in corn. And we, we wouldn't recognize that they were doing that for a purpose. And we right. just take corn back 
and say, what, what, what the heck? You know, this isn't what we thought we were getting. Right. Yeah. The, the advancement of, you know, food, cooking techniques and such like that sometimes skips a step. And we try to, you know, not soak beans for three days or such beforehand like our grandmother did. You know, and heck, if you can go get them fresh out of the field, they got to be good for you, right? Fresh, more. Must fits. be. Yeah, <laughs> short of the first time that you try that and you're sick for a while at best effects. So, yeah, we, we that culinary expertise um, that usually has been transferred down in the family from the matrons and such, you know, has been getting lost as of the last hundred years as we weren't in the kitchens as much with our grandmothers and mothers. No, you know, that's, that's very true. And I tell the story of my, my grandmother on my mother's side of the family was French and she had taught my mother to always peel and de-seed tomatoes right. before she used them. And I mean, we even had sliced tomatoes that were peeled and de-seeded. And I remember going away to Yale and I had a sliced tomato for the first time that had peels and seeds. And I thought it was, the, why would anybody eat it this way? Number one, it actually didn't taste as good. But, right. and, and so, you know, that was passed down. Yep. And, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to, you know, look at these, you know, oral traditions. And you mentioned soaking beans, you know, in, in Tuscany, these guys will soak beans, like, you're, like you say, 48, 72 hours, and they'll change the water. Yep. And they actually allow the beans to ferment. You know, you get this foam on the top of the water. Right. And they're, they're fermenting. And, you know, any traditional culture would know one of the best ways to get rid of lectins is fermentation. Right, and you also know. phytates, too. Yeah, Once and phytates, the, correct. it starts to ferment and starts to quasi-sprout, then the, you know, the phytates have done their job. You know, they're there to grab the nutrients to get the thing to start to do its deal, to life. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's a combination of both benefits by doing that technique. Yeah. And, you know, I tell people that's how traditional cultures yep. have, you know, have learned and have figured out the ways to make these things uh, safe. And you know, as long as we play by the rules, I have nothing against these things. Well, there, you know, I think a lot of our ancestors uh, didn't play by the rules and they were the guinea pigs to figure out, hey, we, we better soak these if we don't want to end up. That's right, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're not doing very well. There, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, uh, enough of memory lane. Uh, tell me, you, I, I know you are fascinated with salts and as salts as a way of delivering flavor. Um, everybody says, oh my gosh, everyone knows how bad salt is for you. Give, give us the argument that salt isn't the evil empire that everybody thinks it is. Well, salt is, um, you know, a necessary nutrient in our diet, number one. We, you know, we can't live very well without salt. Maybe we can't live at all. I don't know for sure. That would fall into your spectrum. But many of the sea salts of the world, all the sea salts of the world, have certain micronutrients in it that we are able to absorb. And they also change the flavor, and they also, you know, change the nutrient delivery. Um, the, you know, years ago in, uh, you know, the, on the Atlantic coast of France, you know, down where they've got salt marshes and such like that going on, I visited this one, you know, salt farm, and what they did was they would bring in ocean water into ponds and, you know, let it condense and have the, you know, salinity raise in it. And in that pond had certain aquatic life that would live at that salinity. And then as it got down to, a, you know, its maximum salinity they wanted, they would drain it off into another pond. And that next pond would go even higher in salinity with a completely different subculture of plants that would exist. So finally, they would be drained down into bed, uh, you know, flatter beds for a final evaporation. And there were these little bright red, almost like sea beans growing in the bottom of this thing. And then it, all of those, um, you know, aquatic life 
added flavor and nutrients to the salt. So I'm not a big fan of using lots of salt, but if you use the salt at the right time, it's good for you. It enhances the flavor and it has the possibility of delivering other micronutrients as well, which I think are a lot of fun. Um, when I was bored a while back pre COVID, but you know, um, I categorized 140 sea salts from around the world by their spectrum analysis and their color. And they actually line up pretty good. You know, a white salt kind of goes, a white flake salt, you know, like a cypress goes with certain dishes, like eggs and such like that. And then you can get into very green salts that are very high in, you know, aquatic life type things that go great with, you know, scotch and, and uh, grilled rapini. You know, so you can start to get these flavor spectrums uh, to match up with the foods that you like to. That's what really interests me of these salt combinations. So it's not just a salt, but it's a number of salts put together to make this, you know, richer, fuller flavor. So should everybody have a library of sea salts at their disposal? Absolutely. I totally agree that that's the best way to go. I do. And, and they don't go bad, unlike other foods right. and such like that, that, you know, over a course of a year, they pretty well lose their effectiveness and flavor. Salt seems to be hanging around for centuries. All right. I think that's a, that's a good place to end it, unless you have any last culinary advice for the home cook that you're holding out because you want people to come to your restaurants. I don't have any last holdout. <laughs> I don't. All right. Well, you've been very generous with your knowledge and your time. And well, my uh, you, you and I are, even as we speak, uh, cooking up our next wellness weekend uh, with uh, Nancy Silverton. Yep. And um, I, we've, we've confirmed that uh, the Ojai Valley Inn in Ojai, California, near Santa Barbara and L.A. Sometime in 2020, we don't have the date yet, uh, we're going to have Wellness Weekend. Good, and that'll be awesome. That'll be fun. Yeah, yeah so that location. Been, yep. And I've talked to yep. uh, Scott, you know, who you met from Paws Up. Yep. And they're real excited to do some more things with us. So that'll be Perfect. fun. Yeah, so we just got to, you know, get it where you don't freeze it up while you're fishing, it'll be all good. <laughs> Jimmy's referring to the fact that uh, my wife Penny caught a very large, uh, beautiful brown giant, trout. Uh, giant. Giant. It was huge. And she landed it, and it was a barbless and catch and release. But I caught nothing, nothing, and just froze to death in the snow. Uh, but she, it was worth it for that big fish. All right, that's enough for the fish stories today. And... <laughs> Jimmy, thanks a lot. Where can people find you? Uh, one, when, one thing people should know, uh, Chef Schmidt is actually the creator and still makes the world famous Adkins bar and was responsible for a great number of the Adkins food products through the years. Uh, fun fact. Yeah, I've been, well, been doing that for the last 20 years. So. Uh, a lot of the food research that, you know, I've done is to try to get proteins to work together. Proteins are, are positively charged, so they tend to repel. Uh, you know, being an electrical engineer, I never practiced it, but it paid off in foods because I was able to uh, figure out how to balance out these isoelectrical charge so they bind together. And then you can make some really fun like we say, foods that you love that love you back, like dough-based products and buns and such like that, that you give up none of the flavor and texture, but you gain all of the nutrient value. So um, a lot of fun things coming. All right. Keep up, keep up the good work. And uh, hopefully everybody will, uh, will be hosting you uh, at another wellness weekend. And so uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. We'll let you know as soon as the dates happen. Great. All right, Good take care. Together. Say hello to the family. Always my pleasure. Give my regards to All Penny. Right. She's the best. All right. See ya. Say hello to Joe Marie. Bye. Bye.
So hopefully we're going to have another uh, wellness weekend at Ojai Valley Inn uh, during 2022. We have the date pending. Okay. Now it's time for our audience question. Uh, this week's question comes from Debbie Weiss on iTunes who asks, I've had a vertebral artery dissection and an aortic aneurysm, and I'm wondering if there is a nutritional way to decrease the likelihood of any more events like these from occurring in the future. Well, so I, you know, I don't know your story, uh, Debbie, but there certainly is a genetic condition that is sometimes known as cystic medial necrosis that we are born with that makes it very susceptible to a tearing literally the three layers that line our uh, arteries. And that's a very common cause of aortic aneurysms and vertebral artery dissections. Uh, one thing that has become increasingly apparent is that there is a class of antibiotics. Uh, many of you uh, may have heard of them. Uh, many of you have, ta have taken them. Uh, Cipro, ciprofloxin is one of them, that unfortunately has been associated with an increased risk of developing uh, particularly abdominal aortic aneurysms. So do be a wary consumer when uh, you may need an antibiotic, but just be careful, do your research. There are a lot of antibiotics out there, and just be careful about the ones that can cause uh, mischief. On the other hand, one of the things, just from a food standpoint, the more that you, you eat foods and supplements that produce more collagen bonds, uh, the better. And interestingly enough, one of the things that's missing in most people's diet is vitamin C. And vitamin C is actually essential for knitting collagen together. Collagen is literally the rebar that holds our blood vessels together. And you can swallow all the collagen you want, but if you don't have vitamin C, you're not going to knit that collagen into a tight um, mesh. So like I've written my books, like I've told you before, buy yourself some timed release vitamin C Take about 1,000 milligrams twice a day. Or buy yourself the chewable vitamin C tablets and just chew one about four times a day. Uh, vitamin C, unfortunately, is a water-soluble vitamin. It leaves our system really after a couple hours. So you really want a continuous supply of, of vitamin C. Uh, good question. Review of the week. Now it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from Volpecht on iTunes, who left a five-star review and wrote, Hello, Dr. Gundry. Love all your podcasts. So good. So informative. I just finished The Energy Paradox, another great informative book. I love how the approaches shift using different focuses with each new book. Well, thanks for that very kind review, Volpecht. Um, you know, that's what usually I try to do. The, each book builds on the next one. And uh, in writing The Energy Paradox, I realized that there was a road that I had not driven down, traveled down, that I needed to go down. And so I'm, you know, I'm really excited about this next book. Uh, so uh, thanks for noticing. I don't just re repeat myself. I, like to bring you a new way of thinking about something. And for all of you out there listening, if you have any questions you'd like to hear me answer, leave me a review in iTunes along with your question, and I'll be sure to answer is it as soon as I can. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.